and producer of OmniU presents the H3O Art of Life show. The title of this show is Reflections on Iconology. Icons are people who are extraordinary, who live extraordinary lives and who leave a legacy that causes them to be respected and honored for many, many years after they have made their transition. Iconology is the study of such icons, and today we are looking at two of those icons. One is Oscar Brown Jr., and I have here representing his family, his daughter, Maggie Brown, mm -hmm. who likes to call herself an entertainer. Mm -hmm. But for Oscar, she was my little Maggie. There you go. So mm -hmm. she's our little Maggie, mm -hmm. and she's here. And for Brother Kalan Phil Coran, we have his wife, Linda Coran, who likes to think of herself as a community activist and I also, of course, the wife of, of ancestor Kalan Phil Coran. Both of these women are much more than we can put under their names on the screen. So before we talk about the icons, I want to talk about the people who were close enough to the icons to know them on levels that we might, might not ever experience, the more intimate levels. Let us begin with Oscar Brown, Jr., okay. my little Maggie. Yes, my dear. Glad to be here on The Art of Life. So tell us about tell yourself. Tell us about myself. Yes. Uh, I am an entertainer, a singer, songwriter. I've been writing songs. Um, my father's influence has um, definitely rubbed off on me in terms of my ability to work with poetry now. I know this. There was a time when if people asked me, oh, are you writing songs? I was like, not really. I might write a little bit and then put it away. But now if, I'm, if the duty calls, I'm able to write. And um, I was telling, trying to explain to some young people some of my references and influences. And I was telling them that not only is it Oscar Brown Jr., but also Oscar Brown Sr., my grandfather, that in both instances, um, these were people in my family who I knew fought to make things better for people, for black people, but for people in general, just the, that life would be lived with more joy and comfort and security and less intimidation and oppression. Um, my grandfather came up from Mississippi in the Great Migration years and ended up selling in Chicago to work against restrictive housing covenants and to make it so black folks had condominiums. And he had joined a group of black intelligentsia that tried to start a 49th state. And um, daddy called him, he said, yes, my father was a race man. He, you know, he just was just definitely for black people, even though he was a mulatto of skin, m nice and light like me. But uh, that, you know, Big Oscar was, you know, if it was two fighters fighting, he was for the black one. And if they were both black, he was for the one with the black trunks. And that was just the funniest <laughs> thing when he would say that. He was a race man. And, and so that rubbed off on daddy and though Oscar Sr. expected Oscar Jr. to go into real estate and law, he, he you know, he tried. But that's not what took. He had this wonderful gift of writing. And so Daddy, um, you know, struck out um, in, in the direction of the arts and a musical play originally. And uh, I just saw these examples of those two men in my family that uh, felt, seemed to feel a responsibility for making a change toward the positive for people. And so I grew up feeling like that's what I'm supposed to do with my talent. If I have the attention, you know, that that's, that's what we're supposed to do with it. And then once you start having your own children, of course, you become more vested in making sure that they inherit an earth that is much more equitable than the one we're living on. When I first met your father, I met him in the company of the likes of Dr. Margaret Taylor Goss. Yes, yes, she was, she's right, she was right. still, right. He mm -hmm. was hanging out mm -hmm. with His her, comrade. with August Savage, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with Frank London Brown. He was with all the people who were regarded as radicals. Yeah. And Dick when Durham. you say making things mm -hmm. better for black people, mm -hmm. 
that w they didn't know any other way of life. Right. You know, and so to 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 find yourself, and I was very fortunate to just be somewhere near Gwendolyn Brooks mm -hmm. and Dr. Burroughs mm -hmm. and your father mm -hmm. and, and these other people because these people had great ideas yes. and they knew peop other people with great ideas. You I know, would they, act on them. Paul and felt empowered, felt it necessary and felt empowered to act on them. Right. Because we still have these great ideas, but there's something that has happened in the water and stuff that uh, we, uh, some, uh, we feel a little less empowered. You yes, know, there's been a leadership that's that's uh, missing. Yes, and and the void, it you know, we we cling, we we look at Oscar and and uh, Kalan Phil Coran as our great icons and cling to them because again they're like the last of these strong figures that definitely stood up, that definitely lived their lives not for uh, you know um, monetary right. remuneration, but right. um, lived their lives out on the limb. Right, you know, and and definitely gave and definitely saw the need to to impart it to young people. Right. And yeah. you know, they met regularly at Dr. Burrell's house. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know? So there was a time when black people came together in intimate circles and they talked about the condition of our people. They talked about the conditions in the city and in the world. Mm -hmm. They talked about the things that needed to be done they planned for the contributions they would make. I remember when Frank London Brown wrote the book Trumbo Park mm -hmm. and it became a national bestseller and everything. You know, he was going to New York and they gave this big party, you know, but these were these were people who were not just talking about doing something, mm -hmm. but they were doing something and the story of Trumbo Park was about black people moving into public housing mm. in a community that was segregated right. and the kinds of terrorism to mm, which they, they were face. subjected mm. for just trying to live somewhere right. in the city. Right. So to, to have to be up close and personal as you were with that kind of legacy with a grandfather mm -hmm. and a father mm -hmm who talked and walked and lived that way had to rub off on you unless you off were on me so tough i'm just deaf. i'm always feeling so connected to history it's just yeah. like everywhere i look still especially even still being you know being in chicago there's 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 not much if it's if it's bronzeville if it's the bud billiken or if it's just there's just so many things that i feel connected to right and and that and that and it excites me and it makes me want to somehow find a way musically, poetically, or otherwise right, right. to impart that to young people, right. to get them enthusiastic and feeling good and proud and like, oh man, this is so hip and tough and look at how resilient we were and how smooth and cool we came through this with all this, still this grace and this rhythm and this, right, this you know, right. what do they call it now? Uh, oh God, it's a word anyway, swagger and all. Well. Uh, and I want to carry that on. Right. You know, I want to rise to that. Right. But there's so much, and, and we can start talking about Baba Kalan because he was warning us that, you know, there is so much to dumb that down in us. Right. There is so much that will, uh, I, I shouldn't say dumb down, but this, it kind of like caps it. It caps it because there's, there's a vibration that everything, you know, everything is on vibration. And so if, if we keep it, the vibration that our youth keep having access to, is not one that's of a higher level than we are seeing the results of that right now. Right. You know. I have to I have to go now to Linda Coran, you know. I can't even remember when your father was your your husband was not there. You know, Why? I can remember right. when when Oscar Brown was there right. in my life. Mm -hmm. But it just seems like Brother Phil was always there. He was there mm -hmm. forever. All the mm -hmm. things I did seemed to run into him. Yes. Like going to the Afro Arts Theater where oh, you yes. could feel, you know, you're talking about black and proud. I'm mm -hmm. telling you, you couldn't be oh, waking man. up, waking you, up. You nothing ever Dawn inspired of a great you new more. Day. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then to go out for an evening at Transitions East, yes. you know, and not be in a drunken bar. Right. talking loud and mm. but in a civilized place where you were sophisticated and and cool you mm -hmm, know mm -hmm, where you mm -hmm. just 
you were somebody, Absolutely. you know, and you just were walking around in your skin being somebody all day all and day all long. night yes. because you had a culture to bathe in, mm. you know. We were drenched in that culture. Yeah, talk and about it. Oscar and Theo, when they were alive, that is what it was all about. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you look at Theo's background of how he even became who he was, how was he birthed? How was his evolution mm -hmm. into who he became? Mm -hmm. It's like as a child, he used to go and look at lynchings because there mm -hmm. in Oxford, Mississippi, you would see all of these black men being lynched down mm -hmm. there. And then his mother lived close to William Faulkner, who was the Nobel Peace Prize laureate. Mm -hmm. And so he would bring books of his poems and essays and, pen and pencils and paper over to Frankie Mae Green well, Raglan. Frankie, Frankie Mae was mm -hmm. his mama, mm -hmm. and she would give them to her bright son, Phil. Mm -hmm. And then, so he had that piece going, that type of education to start off with it as a very young man. Mm -hmm. And then you go on to he went to this, he went to Lincoln University, but right before he went there, he was in Trent, Michigan, where he went to a prestigious school there as well, where he majored in chemistry. Mm -hmm. And his mother gave him a chemistry set, and he just had his way in the basement. He said mm -hmm. he could have just blown he the place up, oh, but he really got into that. Mm -hmm. That's when he really started paying attention to astronomy, mm -hmm. because here we look at what's going on here right in the here, Earth, but, but we don't look at above. how. Uh, Are we being above, impacted so the by the heavens above? Mm -hmm. I know Phil could do your uh, astrological chart, chart yes, mm -hmm. and Phil would chart. tell me, he'd say, on oh, this day and that day and the other day, those are going to be your very great days. Mm -hmm. So on those days, you want to plan to really do some wonderful things. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes I would forget, and those days would be, still be great. awesome. Still be great. And I would say, go back to my calendar and I said look he knew exactly what it was so mm. he started looking at the stars when he was there in Trent Michigan dealing with chemistry there then he went on to St. Louis and he actually had was in the Lincoln University's chemistry classes his teacher had actually been taught by Albert Einstein. Mm -hmm. These were the people who were training him, mm -hmm. and he and then they put him into the the symphony mm -hmm. there at the school. So he was being trained mm -hmm. there. Then after that, he ends up going into the service, where he ends up in the Naval School of Music. When our research for his obituary mm -hmm. here in his in his memorial service, what we discovered is that the Naval School of Music. Anyone who attends that school will end up being an international ambassador of music. Mm. And that is truly who Theo was. Yeah. He studied music from all over the world. He could tell any people about their culture. And he had just recently, in like 1995, went to China and let them know what their history was, which is where they gave him the name Kalan put that to his name, Phil Cohen, and he really embraced that name. Mm -hmm. So it was an honor and a privilege to live with an icon like Phil, who was so committed to our people being uplifted, mm -hmm. enlightened, enlightened yeah. empowered, mm -hmm. knowing about their good health mm -hmm. through being a coming vegetarians, knowing about the water, having been a chemistry major. Mm -hmm. I remember I was researching with him because he used to have a research team and I was on that research team and he had us studying the tension of the surface tension of water. You know, why does that occur? And so in him looking at the water, he saw all of these organisms in the water. He said, we're going to have to drink better. So he was putting these things in place before it was even known so to popular. the general po mm -hmm. po population. Mm -hmm. And I even want to say, Phil, here he is a man. He knew more about you ought to be breastfeeding when no one was breastfeeding than anyone else did. He actually started a revolution of women breastfeeding, and people don't even get that about Phil. I mean, mm -hmm. he had me in 1971 when I had Penta. You, 
could not see anyone breastfeeding. It was unheard of. Mm -hmm. When I breastfed Penta, my family had a fit. She's going to die. Oh, she's going to lose weight. She drink you the have milk to give her that bottle. Baby. You got when they say that mothers that cow's milk is closest to mother's milk. In other words, mother's milk is the it's best. It's actually the best. Right now, no even, tigers go and absolutely. drink the, the, the milk of a giraffe. Absolutely, who does this? Yeah, the, yeah. Everybody drinks their own, okay, usually. from their mama, yeah, okay. Usually. And Phil yeah. knew to go to the La Leche League. Mm. No computers. Phil was a genius. He was in the library all the time. He was like Linda, connect with the suburbanites who are in the La Leche League and they mm. will train you on how to breastfeed successfully. Mm. And I did that. And he promoted having home births. So our third child, Lyra, I actually had her at home while he was in another room playing the harp. I got to breathe to the beat and rhythm of his harp playing. Mm. And at that time we were so connected that he just knew when I needed to breathe faster mm. and I would just breathe to the rhythms of that and the sounds of that heart music. And once Lyra was born, it thundered and lightened in this one area in front of our house. Mm. And it came out in the newspaper that some weird occurrence had happened that the weather did not see. And Phil said that is God announcing Lyra has Her arrived. Birth. Mm. And Lyra is one of the constellations that's Orpheus harp that's in the heavens because he fully understood the heavens. Mm -hmm. So learned so much from Phil. And the, to know thyself. Yes. To know thy history. Absolutely. To know thy culture. All of these things are things that people take for granted. They don't you know, children are getting names that have no meaning. They just right. ha they sound good. Absolutely. To, to, but they ha they don't connect them to a kinship group. They don't connect them to a destiny. They right. don't connect them to a purpose. We don't have cultural roots. We don't. We are just. Uh, I'm trying to think of the attorney who said this. Tom Todd said. Oh, yes. He called us. Hyper, hydroponic, meaning we just grow in water, no soil, no soil. Yes. nowhere to have roots. Yes. No real roots. And mm -hmm. so you're not connected to anything, and therefore you do not have the substance. Right. You may look like lettuce, but you don't have the nutritional value that would come with leaves yes. that have been nurtured by soil, that has been enriched by the sun and the other things that mm. go into Absolutely. the building of the soil. Yes. So here we are just floating freely, hydroponic, yes. you know, not connected to anything, and we're not trying to anchor ourselves because that's what we need to do. We have to anchor ourselves yes. culturally. Now, I understand why your father could not have changed his name. He came from a legacy. You don't leave Oscar Brown Sr and go to be in anybody else because hmm. that like that connection you keep connections mm -hmm. you know you don't throw away yeah there's an oscar solid, brown the third yeah, he's late you now but then an oscar brown the fourth right. now too. you don't throw mm -hmm. away solid connections mm -hmm. but where there are none you don't continue to just float on out into the stratosphere. Right. You try to sink an anchor down, so you try to give children names that have meaning, that give purpose, that give direction. You try to give people sus substance, Absolutely. and you have to give them sustenance. Yeah, so when he's burden. at this, this level of diet, you yes. know, you are what you eat. Mm -hmm the level of diet, that was a revolution. And who was leading this? He was leading yes, the revolution. Yes, he was, absolutely. Where are these ideas? I don't, you know what? You say that he was born in the South. I think he may have descended he to the South from somewhere really else. Because <laughs> the things that he learned, even from his chemistry teacher yes. in the universities and the institutions, mm. he was not learning the kind of things you just talked about. He didn't right. learn he how didn't. to have a healthy diet. He didn't learn about these things by referring to things he got from institutions. He, some of these things, things were intuitive. They were part of his nature. He knew 
the truth. Well, remember, Phil did live a regular kind of life Before. up until mm -hmm. 1961, mm -hmm. July 10th. Mm -hmm. And he said the Almighty Creator came him and told him it is his job to uplift our people through his music. He had a wonderful, successful career at that time. He was a fingerprint technician. Mm -hmm. And Phil was just whatever he touched, He's it was expert. going to be, mm -hmm. he was an expert mm -hmm. at it. Always. He was a forensic He was a forensic expert. Yes. yes. He, he was, was a master. He mastered whatever he, whatever he did. Whatever he did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which is which is the difference between being mediocre yes. and oh, yes. being a master. He was a master. You know, you can get away with just doing some stuff. Yes. But when you do some stuff that is so extraordinary. Yes that it gets the attention of other people who do the same stuff that you do, mm. right? Yeah. then that tells you that this is something out of the ordinary. Absolutely. Your father's memory, the memory well, let me of see. both of them. Yes. The mem he, he could recite. Oh, you're talking about their own, right, their memories, yeah. yeah. They oh could my goodness. They, yeah. Yes. they could remember. Mm -hmm. They didn't have Alzheimer's. <laughs> they did not no have dementia. Alzheimer's. He no was dementia. what, eight, no. 90 years Bill old? Bill was 90 years mm. old. 90 yeah. years yeah, old, your father was 78. Dad, yeah, he lived till 78. Mm -hmm. They mm. remembered. They were yeah. powerful minds because they were using their minds, mm. stimulating their minds, expanding their minds, like mm. their thinking mm -hmm. all the time. Always what exercising they knew. That Always muscle. exercising mm -hmm. the muscle called the brain. Mm -hmm. Right. And Phil even studied the brain, mm -hmm. studied the ear. Like mm -hmm. here he is playing music, because one of the things in working with Phil, it's like he studied any and everybody. Mm -hmm. And Plato says to change the music is to change the people. Yeah. And so he worked on that all of his life, to change people through the music. Mm -hmm. And we all know when we went to the Afro Arts Theater, it's like, People were taking those wigs off mm -hmm. and going home and becoming African queens. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. People who were ebony black like we were in Africa were clear that they were as beautiful as anyone else. Mm -hmm. It just completely transformed the world. And he said it all comes from the music. Phil even said that the Bible was initially um, sung. sung. Mm. That's well, he, he said, said people was, yeah. sang before they spoke. Right. Mm -hmm. And I believe yes, that that's I clear to me mm -hmm. that it made perfect sense. When they talk about the Big Bang Theory, I'm thinking they're talking about a musical note. I, <laughs> in fact, I heard someone say, who was, who was looking at the skies, that now in this black hole, this is current now, this is in the last week or so that someone said this to me, in this black hole, there's vibration. Yes. And, the, and it's vibrating at the level of a B flat. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I can get that. So yeah. the universe is vibrating at the level of musical notes. Now, when you hear B flat, it's an ominous musical tone. And you say, mm. oh my goodness, the universe is up there. Mm telling us something, you know, because it's vibrating at this, this, this tone that is the yes. same tone that you would hear in the theater if something disastrous mm -hmm. was about to happen, mm -hmm. Doom, right. you know. Right. So, but the <laughs> thing is that the vibration, as you pointed out, everything is vibrating even when it appears to be totally solid. Still. Yes, you know, yes. everything's frequency. I'm everything's learning that more frequency. and more. Yeah. And, right. and so the frequency that we're carrying, the frequency of the music and the things that we're letting influence us and be in our space, our aura, our mental, then they, they matter. They matter. Mm -hmm. That's not taught, that's not emphasized nearly enough. Um, but I just wish that it was so that People who are especially making music, making images, making things that are culturally influencing us all yeah. because of this media and entertainment industry that, that is going on here, I wish that they, they saw themselves like I do. I feel like I'm responsible for doing something with this talent or this attention that, that promotes a more positive you know, outcome to our future. Mm -hmm. like, like that is our responsibility to do that. And you mm -hmm. know, some people say, oh, you know, stop worrying about saving the world. You can't preach and all that sort of thing. Well. 
I guess I, I, only until I'm gone, you know, only until I take my last breath, you know, I, that's what I feel like. If, if things are bad, then they need to be better. And how can we make things better? Well, let's Ooh. see what Oscar Brown has to say for us. Oh. We got to roll in. Got a little clip, huh? Oh, yes. Yeah, for I got a couple Daddy's quotes for Phil here, too. Mm -hmm. Now, this will sound radical as hell, but I, music has always come to me as a gift. I have never had to pay a dollar for a song. I've never had to file an application or make out a, you know, a request for a grant. All I had to do was pay attention. And if I got paid what I paid, I would be well paid. It's not necessary that music be sold by the note or by the song. It, it's... If I get a gift, like if you came over to my house and gave me a, a dog, and I sold a dog, or you come over to my house, you gave me a plant, and then you find it all wilted, you know I didn't appreciate the gift. I got a gift. I, people say, how did you get in show business? Talent. If I hadn't been talented, I would not have been in it. I started writing songs. People thought they were interesting. I loved those strokes. I got better at it, and I worked, and I worked, and I worked, and I worked, and I enjoyed doing that. Um, we had a hit show called Joy 66 in Chicago. Couldn't get them to do an original cast album under that. and Couldn't do it with anybody else because I'm under contract to Mercury. I was on Atlantic and uh, I said, well, you know, you know gotta give me a break, you know. Put me out when, not, don't put me out with all your killers. So you're a man who goes to the record, uh, to the radio station, he's only going to be able to carry five records and he's only going to pay three of those. So let me go when you got some duds and I'm, I'm hot stuff. Boy, they put me out at Christmas time with Aretha Franklin and the average white man. I was born dead, you know. <laughs> Shit. So there was, there was the politics of that. I could never really beat that. And then after a while, I gave up. You know, there was nobody in there who even knew me. You know, they, they changed people in this whole new regime of young people who never even fucking heard of you. And it's a different company. It's got the same name, but it's a whole different beat of, uh, group of people in there running. So you forget that. They still got your stuff, and they can determine you're trying to eat out of this album, and they took it off the market. I always thought, gee, there ought to be some way, you know, for me to, because I'm trying to make a living off of this. And if you take it off where the people can buy it, that really ain't it. But I, have, of course, and no artist has any control. I want this to be cool. You know, I want to wrap up what I've done. There's a whole lot of music in my head you don't have heard. I'd love to codify that and put that down. There's plays that I've written that I'd like to see them. I don't know the play works. I don't know. I just know I wrote the script. And I thought it was a damn good idea. And I'd like to be participant in its, in its pre presentation. I'd love to do any of that. Uh, I still love to perform. Although, um, you know, I get aches and pains and stuff, and this shit hurts. And uh, so that doesn't, that's not as cool as that used to be. But it's real cool when it is. And I love, you know, entertaining. I just found out I enjoy that. I'm good at it, and I don't even know how come, you know. Uh, it's like, you know, she moves me, man. I don't see how it's done. We've got to fight this. We've got to fight this. Um, I... I want to say that I think there are things to be done now. There are exciting new ways to deal with presenting information, with getting impressions, in, in changing minds and changing hearts that never existed before. And that we should be imaginative about that. And don't be stuck in old ways of doing things. You know, the problems that I faced in my youth, you don't, don't have. I attended a meeting yesterday. Everybody's talking about stuff when I was a kid. Nobody would have talked about that. Not black folks. They would have been scared. It was, but now it's a whole different set, set of circumstances. And there are so many new ways of doing things. You can fax stuff, and you can email stuff, and you can put it on the Internet, and you can bounce it off a satellite, and you can send it to a cable. And we're around complaining and whining that we haven't got this and we haven't got that. We don't recognize what the hell we do have. Emphasize what you do have and show the beauty of it. They say, well, our kids don't know who this person is or who that hero was. Tell them. <laughs> tell them. If you're an artist, tell them. Don't lament. 
that they don't have it and figure out ways. Put the information in the storefront that's near the, uh, the bus stop where they transfer. You know, make arrangements for the bus company to let you stamp their transfer so they can spend 30 minutes or 40 minutes for a low price and see your stuff. And have that going on all over the city. Why do your children have to be in, in, uh, ignorant if you're intelligent? And if you are smart enough to, to give them the information they need, and there are so many ways to impart the information now, we need to have a revolution of the human heart. It's not enough to just change the system if the same old shitty attitudes are in the people who are running the system. We've got to somehow appeal to people's desire for peace their desire to live in harmony with their neighbors, their desire to be able to raise their children with dignity and have hip things happen in life. And there's a lot of that out there. And we have to have the courage to appeal to that. And diligence, don't give up. Don't give up. at the Kennedy Center, mm -hmm. and before I went to do it at the Kennedy Center, I came to Chicago, I came to your dad's house. What? And he sat with me, oh. and he ran, he ran Chicago down, like in the late 50s, he just like ran it down. And he was so, he didn't know me from home, or somebody gave me his phone number, and I called him, just, I said, mm -hmm, I'm an actor, he said, come on over, man. And he sat with me for probably about five hours, and we just talked. Stop. Yeah. That is the greatest That's story. The greatest. That's my Oscar Brown Jr. story. Oh, man. He was so generous. Thank you. So your you. pops is like up there for me. Oh, that. that's a wonderful And he didn't know me. He didn't know me. Right. It's Somebody exactly how he was. Somebody literally gave me his number, and I called him. I said, I'm an actor. I'm getting ready to do this play. He said, come on over. I love it.
I always like to give credit to those who contributed to my understanding. <laughs> and I have to people like uh, Professor Lewis A. Ladd and Mrs. Ruby Harris Gill and Dr. O. Anderson Fuller at Lincoln University, uh, people like J. McShann and Sun Ra, uh, teachers, even like my yoga teacher, Sri Narodi, and uh, Brother John and Reverend O.W. Winkfield, people who uh, helped me go beyond just playing music, but the thinking of what music means. And uh, eventually come into the reason that music is the root of culture and that uh, we live in a cultural flux. And so some of the um, work that I have done, although I did have a background in chemistry and science, uh, the work that I have done uh, and have built up over the last 33 years has been focused in unraveling the cultural mysteries of the past so that we could see a brighter path. Actually, melanin is at the seat of our musical differences because uh, there are some differences in perception and response to music, and it's based primarily on the amount of melanin that we have in our cochlea and in our uh, auditory uh, canal. Uh, also, the amount of melanin that we have, uh, that we produce in our diurnal rhythm from the pian. Uh, you can't separate, really, music from anything. Because uh, in the old world, in the ancient world, many thousands of years ago, our ancient fathers, our ancestors knew that music was the primary uh, mover of all thinking. Back in 1961, when I came into knowledge of uh, how cultures operate and how they are born, um, I stumbled on the term sanjitum, which means teaching people through the arts, a great that imprinted the uh, the cultural concepts on the community. And we have that now, like uh, when Christmas comes around, you have all the Christmas music and you have all the pictures of Santa Claus and all of that, you know, in one sense. But we don't have anything like that for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so, um, the Afro Art Theater was uh, somewhat uh, a kind of, uh, uh, of an establishment that we opened in order to pull the art of our people into a focal point. And, and it became a center so that it brought all the people who were very good in these various forms, like the Spencer Jackson family in the gospel music, Darlene Blackburn, who introduced African dance to the Chicago audience. Now African dance gets a lot of play, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, d various people who um, came in the field of drama, like uh, O'Coral, Harold Johnson, and uh, we had poets uh, like the sister Gwendolyn Brooks, Obasi got a, uh, they had their artists there to perform. But most of all, at that time in 1967, we didn't have a place where we could go and glorify in our culture, mm -hmm. an establishment for mm -hmm. that. So uh, On the Beach uh, was a project of the summer of 67, where out on the 64th Street Beach, we set up a whole cultural panorama dealing with the history and culture of our people. And the music was the centerpiece of it, and so many people attended that. I asked the people on the last day in August, would you like to do this year round? And they said, yes. Yeah. Brother Tony Courtney used to say that if you have a puzzle in a box and you got a picture on the box, the people will try to work the box according to, mm -hmm. you know, they'll try to work the puzzle. But if the wrong picture's on the box, you're in trouble. <laughs> 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 and uh, that seemed to me to be a good analogy of how we keep using other models. And that's why I speak so often of the African mind. There never was a time we couldn't solve our problems, but we have to use the proper process. In Africa, throughout, they have the old tradition, you know. You learn your family's history first, because when you're a little baby, even when you're in the womb, you can hear.
hear that history being recited. Mm -hmm. See, and it's recited over and over at every gathering. And so the most important thing a person has to know is who they are and where they come from and what it means to be that. Mm -hmm. Then that's what was cut off from the slave. Mm -hmm. He's nothing but a slave. And when you think back, that's all you can reach is a slave. The door is blocked beyond that. So the history is all wrong. The history of uh, science is wrong. The history of agriculture is wrong. The history of uh, mathematics is wrong. The history of astronomy is wrong. The history, period, is wrong because they lied in the 15, 16, 1700 to make a white superiority uh, group in Europe. They give all the credit. You pick up on any science and all they mention are the European. I'll play another piece and Alex, since, since I was talking about the modes, is that I'm playing forms. And these forms are cosmic forms. And so uh, if you listen, you will hear dual forms going on. Uh, uh, I like that most. I believe that my ancestor, whoever I was at one time, really enjoy listening to two things simultaneously. And so I play a music that's two-sided. Sometimes it gets three-sided. You can separate things going on while I'm playing. And uh, I wanted to explain it. That's cosmic music. <laughs> Catch your breath after that. You don't have you? to mm -hmm. catch your mm -hmm. breath after mm -hmm. that. Well, we don't have to breathe but five more minutes. Okay. <laughs> so let's see what we how we can sum up the un the insummerable <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Just> creative <laughs> hope right. of words. Mm -hmm. We didn't say a thing about this, so okay. we probably should. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Phil actually created this for me. And I don't know, right, okay, so That's can right. they see it? Like that. Yep. And yeah, that. Phil always dealt with and taught that we are people from Egypt, that that was one of the highest African cultures ever. And you get to see the engineer that Phil was, how he put all of these blocks in the different locations, and he painted this with the eyes of Horus, mm -hmm. who are from Egypt, and then he put the moon at the bottom and the paths that they go in and he had the sun and the path that they go in up top and then when you look at this outfit over here that I made Phil also dealt with the seven pointed star he was very attuned to the seven is the number of the black man and so we were brought up with the five pointed star or the three pointed triangles so there you get to see the seven pointed star and he said one of the 
animals, the highest animal that the Egyptians dealt with was the bee. The scarab. The, the bee, scarab, the scarab bee, bee. Right. Because he said it is the only animal that rolls its food in a perfect sphere. And so they saw that as a very high animal. So I put that on when I used to perform for him briefly. I put that symbol on my outfit, and of course I used to make plenty of outfits for him. But one of the things I thought about when he was talking about that counter beat, and I know all we have is a couple of minutes, but one of those beats was one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, and he used to do two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. And he taught that, and so that was the beat that I used to do every day when I made bread. And all of the children told me when they came to the event where we brought all of the families together, mm -hmm. they said they all remembered that beat. That's what they and remember. yes, you know, so we have to keep this music alive. Mm -hmm. We have to look today at what it is that we need to put in place to take us to the next level, opposed to looking at it going in the direction that it's going and giving our complaints. Instead, mm -hmm. we gotta look at what we got can do to, right. to move it up. That's right. And Sister Maggie, mm -hmm. you are doing that in your own way. Yes, um, in my own way, working with young people, starting a youth repertory theater company, and uh, I need more talented youth to please come my way to the Blue Gargoyle over in Hyde Park is where we meet and rehearse. And um, that's also continuing in the footsteps because I certainly got my start, so did my younger sister Africa in, in theater, really, musical theater, being on the stage in the plays. And so it's about just trying to make uh, some, some musical and theatrical presentations that will try to help encourage changing the vibe out here so that we the, have the frequency is, is more for peace and, and harmony instead we of... We have uh, to inoculate yeah. our young. Because they've been inoculated Absolutely. with what's happening Absolutely. Now. They must be immunized like against right. corruption. Yes. Yeah. The other thing about the scarab beetle is that the, you know, the flooding of the Nile, whenever the Nile flooded, the only thing that remained as a living thing was the scarab beetle. Mm -hmm. scarab when beetle. the waters mm -hmm. receded, they were there still rolling their food along yeah. in mm -hmm. perfect spheres. Mm -hmm. So it's a sign of life mm -hmm. everlasting, yeah. a resurrection. And it's very important that we understand symbols, that we understand numbers. Yes. And these kinds of things cannot be learned by reading a periodical. Right. These things have to be learned by people who study these things, not for the commercial value of knowing these things, but for the upliftment of the human family. That's right. And so to have descendants, for both of these men to have descendants who can carry on their legacy. You don't have a choice. It isn't you're just taking your responsibility. That is an awesome, gifts are awesome. Yes. If you do not utilize them, they might in fact devour you. Mm. You must use your gifts yes. because they are given to you by a source that is greater than yourself. Indeed. Pay attention Give and thanks. be obedient. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was so great. Mm -hmm. So great. Mm -hmm. And as a community Don't activist, I'm going to say a call for unity. Let us share one mind through a vision of our future. While we're holding hands to form a circle around our mother.